morning, everyone, or good afternoon now. Um, I'm going to give it just a second so that we can get everyone from the waiting room into uh, the Zoom call. It takes a couple seconds. Zoom hasn't quite caught up to uh, the waiting room slash attendee uh, thing quite yet. So we'll start in just a minute. Okay. Okay, I see the waiting room emptying out, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning to everyone and welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Rachel Rizzo and I'm the Director of Programs at the Truman Center for National, uh, National Policy and the Truman National Security Project. Um, I am so excited to welcome everyone here today for a discussion uh, on Gail Samak Lemon's new book, uh, The Daughters of Kobani. I have been an ardent follower of Gail's work for such a long time, and I am just so thrilled that she's here with us at Truman and um, attending uh, this event today and leading us in this book talk. So Gail, thank you so much for, for being here with us today. Um, for those of you who might be new to this space, uh, Gail is the author of multiple New York Times bestsellers. Uh, the Dressmaker of Kayurkana, Ashley's War, uh, which is being made into a major motion picture, and the book we'll be discussing today, The Daughters of Kobani. Um, this book is based on years of on-the-ground reporting and is the unforgettable story of the women of the Kurdish militia that became part of the world's best hope for stopping ISIS in Syria. So this story is really brought to you by those women who have been battling ISIS town by town, street by street since 2013. Uh, Gail serves as an adjunct senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. She's a frequent speaker on national security topics, including at the Aspen Forum and TED Forums. And she's given talks at places like West Point, ODNI, DIA, the US Naval Academy, and, and many more. Um, her TED talk uh, on Ashley's War and the reshaping of the hero story to include women uh, has received more than a million views worldwide. Um, so Gail, again, thank you so much for being, us, uh, being with us today. Um, I'm also thrilled to introduce our, model, our, our moderator today, uh, Elise Labatt, who is a foreign policy columnist, uh, foreign policy magazine columnist, and an adjunct professor at American University's School of International S Service. Uh, Elise was a correspondent for CNN for two decades and covered US foreign policy and international affairs for the network, uh, reported from more than 80 countries, covered seven secretaries of state. Uh, her work appears in various uh, media news outlets, including Political Magazine, uh, for whom she traveled to Israel and Turkey with National Security Advisor John Bolton. She also appears as a foreign affairs analyst on MSNBC and has reported extensively on the conflicts in Syria, Ukraine, and Israel, and covered nuclear talks with Iran uh, and the signing of the new, uh, 2016 nuclear agreement. Uh, this is only a few highlights for, for an over 20 year career and I could keep going. Um, so before we get started, I'm gonna let everyone know that if they have questions that they would like to pose uh, our, our panelists today, please use the, the Q&A function. Um, we are gonna go for about another 45 minutes. So we'll stop at 1250. So as they're uh, having a moderated discussion, if you have questions, just use Q&A and we'll go ahead and uh, make sure those are asked. And so at uh, least Gail, I don't wanna waste any more time. So I will hand it over to you to get the discussion started. Thanks again. Thanks so much, Rachel. And I'm thrilled to be with the Truman um, Center and also with Gail, my good friend and, and uh, just partner in crime in, in uh, the field of women covering um, national security. And that's why I'm so glad um, that this book, Daughters of Kobani, is getting so much attention um, as we're celebrating um, Women's History Month because this this story that Gail wrote, um, and just again, as Rachel said, you know, kind of another in her body of work covering um, women and the impact of women and the roles of women in war is really a remarkable story about female empowerment. And that also shows what's at stake um, as the Biden administration thinks about um, setting its policy in Syria and the broader Middle East. So Gail, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm really delighted to be with you. Thank you to the entire team and of course to you, Elise. Um, well, let's let's just dive in. And I thought might be what might be helpful is if we work backwards a little um, and just kind of talk about the broader um, reception 
of the book. As um, Rachel said, this is about this uh, fighting force of women that that really were um, leading the way, and and um, you know these female commanders that um, you know defeated ISIS um, in Syria. And I was just wondering. Um, you know, how it's been received by, by readers that really have not seen women, um, particularly in the Middle East, um, in this role before. It's been a real joy. Uh, it has been a total journey and a true privilege to bring this history to readers and seeing uh, it break through and actually reach and move readers across communities is what has meant so much to me from uh, folks across the political spectrum to, you know, I've been calling into a lot of book clubs and a lot of book clubs in North Carolina and California and Chicago and Missouri and folks who say, you know, I would never have read a foreign policy book or Syria book, but I was really fascinated by these women and I wanted to know about who these women were who beat ISIS. You know, I wanted to understand. And it, it's been so illuminating for me because you realize that, you know, in the end of policy always is about people. We very rarely talk about policy as if it's about people and war as if it is personal. And both are deeply the case. So it is to me, what the, the most gratifying thing is to see it cross uh, audiences and really reach people who might not necessarily uh, have read about Syria before, but who can use this as an entry point to learn so much more, to read so many of the amazing books that have been written uh, on this topic and really to show the human stakes of national security because national security belongs to all of us it says, and it is all of our work yeah well you know i think to kind of drill down on the women aspect um what really just like moved me and spoke to me are the these women that they own their power they say they're not there to make friends you yeah. i remember you and i were talking about it and you said i've never met a group of women who were more comfortable with their power and unapologetic about, you know, projecting it and owning it. And um, they really reached kind of mythic proportions in the region so that then when they did go to these towns and they liberated these towns from ISIS, people said, and they showed up there, people were like, uh, I, I heard about you, but I didn't know that you really existed. I thought it was a myth. So there's a, a moment in the Daughters of Kobani when they talk about the crossing of Manbij, which for those of you who follow military history, right, this is the first contested wet gap crossing the U.S. has undertaken since Korea, according to folks who, who spoke with me uh, on this. And it really is, as much as it is about the women who took on ISIS, it's also a history of U.S. involvement uh, on the ground in northeastern Syria and U.S. involvement in the ISIS fight. So the women went first uh, in the cross, the women's protection units. And actually, it was a U.S. service member who told me that. Cassie, who first got into the book, was saying, you know, and women crossed first on this nighttime contested water crossing into ISIS territory where no one knew what awaited them. And I wanted that chapter for you to feel like, holy cow, what's going to come next? I and did. It was a page turner. <laughs> and and, and thank, thank you. I mean, it means so much from you, of all people, Elise. It's, you know, there were young women who talked to me that as they were going into Manbij, part of uh, the effort to rid the town of ISIS after a brutal rule, that women of all ages, but particularly a lot of older women would come out and put their hands on the face of members of the women's protection units and say, we heard about you. We just didn't know you were real. And quite honestly, that's a very similar experience in the US. So many people have asked me, you know, I saw them on social media, but I wasn't sure if it was real. And actually that's the beginning of the book is in the prologue talking about how I didn't know what the story was. And I really wanted readers to go on the journey with me as to who were these people. Um, they had this kind of mythic showdown, right? Between on the one hand, the Islamic State, which bought and sold women as a central part of who it is and was, and the women's protection units, who of all the fighting forces in the world are almost the only ones that have women's emancipation and women's liberation, not at the periphery, but at the core of their ideology and their motivation. And what were the odds that those two groups would have a showdown every single day in towns across the region with the whole world watching and the Americans backing them? So I wanted um, that whole tension between this mythic story but the very real lives 
because just, just one final note on this, I think when it comes to women, when they do things that are remarkable and groundbreaking, we call them exceptions. And when men do things that are remarkable and groundbreaking, we call them leaders. And I wanted to really reframe that conversation and say, listen, these are not superheroes. These are not, you know, uh, the Valkyries right. with Thor Ragnarok, right? These are real people with families, with friends who are going to be pharmacists and doctors, right? Mm -hmm. uh, who ended up in extraordinary circumstances doing what uh, women do all the time, which is exercise their superpower of just getting on with it. Right. I want to get to the ideology in a minute, but I want to go more into this kind of whole women's the way a woman, you know, yes, it, it I, I hear what you're saying about kind of women, if it's about women, it's exceptional, but the way that they kind of their women's intuition and their thinking and the way a woman's mind works kind of does play into a lot of this. And I remember um, in one of the scenes, and this is Azima, um, one of the commanders. And when she's saying like, when she's fighting, she can't, stop thinking of the man who tried to kill her several times actually and she's like I can't let him get in my head I can't lose focus and there was another time when she said that this fighter this bald fighter like there was a competition between her inner swagger running the morning and her outer dread at night and you know this all plays into it the way a woman thinks um you know sometimes women's intuition they want to follow their gut that isn't necessarily the wrong thing. The the kind of motherly mm. way that they and their um, loyalty to their to their commanders, you know, that their That's command of, I think is all. It's a, it's as much of a woman's story of any woman leader as it is a military story. Yes, I agree with that. It's interesting, you know, because I was talking to special operations folks, right? So the book really follows four of the women from the kind of start of the fight against ISIS to the end. And one of them said to me, was talking about, uh, they, he, this uh, member of special operations had said, you know, at the beginning I thought, would it be strange? We'd never worked with women in a partner force. And he said, but you know, what you saw immediately was the warrior ethos. And that is the same, no matter where you are in the world. And, and, and so it was that tension with also, the fact is that they thought about the plight of women and girls. There's a moment in the battle for Kobani when truly the U.S. is launching airstrikes, but U.S. officials are saying this town is very likely to collapse, right? I mean, there are very few people who thought that Kobani would be the first site of a battlefield defeat for the Islamic State. In part, it was because they were they had fewer uh, people, fewer weapons, less ammunition, uh, less food, less of everything than ISIS, which really was at that time, much more of a conventional like force than an insurgency. Um, but Nauru's the head of the women's protection units realizes the one thing they have is will. And she kind of invokes that moment and says, you know, to, to Azima and to Rojda and to all of these women you'll meet that these men think you're worth nothing. Look at what they're doing to the Yazidi community. Look at what they think women are. Show them what you're capable of. Show them what you can do. So that even if this is your last moment, it will be worth something. And it reminds me, um, there were so many times, as you say, like that these women were doubted and they went into this knowing that the U.S. doubted them, that the U.S. support for them was shaky. And there was a, a moment, I remember when Kobani could have fell and you have now Secretary of State Tony Blinken, then um, Deputy National Security Advisor saying like, there are gonna be a lot of Kobanis. We can't, you know, we can't protect them all. And there was a question about whether, you know, the US should help. Um, this was towards the end of the Obama administration. They deferred to the Trump, the incoming Trump administration which said no, but later, guess what? Ended up supporting the YPJ because they were the only force that could take Raqqa. And so again and again, these women proved, you know, their doubters wrong. I think that that is 100% true. And I think the people closest to them, I mean, in terms of them proving their doubters wrong, you know, the Americans really get behind them after they see what happens in Kobani. And they think, you know what, we need a fighting force that can take terrain from the Islamic State, keep terrain and advance. And really just keep every step by step, like, is this a partnership that can work? Um, they weren't sure at the beginning, you know, we follow Mitch and others from special operations to 
who are these women? You know, they didn't know because they had only seen them uh, either on, in the media or in other ways. They had never met them on the ground. And there's a moment when they're on the ground for the first time, right? With, with Mitch, you and I talked about this or early on when, when this young woman who fought yes, ISIS. The one the young woman comes out and says, how many people did you kill? I've killed 20 people. She, and she's quite right, right? And, and she says, like, I bet I killed more ISIS than you. Yes. And, and it yes. wasn't about, it was, I think that moment, there were so many firsts for the U.S., in this story and in this history. And I really wanted the book to show it the human terms, what that looked like. And the Americans understood very deeply that this was a partner force that had will and that would take the objective. And they felt deeply connected to them. It was just the translation between the ground and Washington that was very complicated. And it wasn't that they didn't understand how skilled the partner was. It was the trying to figure out how do you navigate this world and how, you know, diplomatically. Yeah, I mean, I remember this, this scene that we're talking about with this um, young 20 year old woman um, that they write that you wrote that the special ops guys, and even Brett McGurk, who was the kind of ISIS envoy at the time, who is now, you know, um, leading uh, Mideast policy over at the White House at the NSC, said they witnessed this mixture of admiration, pride, and jealousy of their commitment and their dedication, but also guilt because they knew that at the end, the US really wanted them to retake this territory, but they knew they weren't gonna be able to give them the political support they need because Turkey saw the Kurds as you know a terrorist force and existential threat. Yeah, and, and there is this push me, pull you, this tension throughout the book that is the reality of US policy on the ground in northeastern Syria. This is the chosen partner from the United States from 2014 on that has taken 10,000 casualties. I'm sorry, lost 10,000 of its own in the fight against ISIS uh, from across communities, certainly not just from the Kurdish community, Kurds, Arabs, Turkmen, Christian. Uh, and they did that as America's partner fighting ISIS really for the world, for the region, for Europe, for the United States, so that the Islamic State would not have a territory from which it was able to launch attacks on Washington, on London, on Brussels, right? And, and that was uh, the work that they did. And that moment you mentioned is a, a member of US Special Operations who's at a rally point and he's looking at 30 young women in a flatbed truck uh, as they're get, about to head off to the front. In the well, originally they thought these women were window dressing. Well, they weren't sure, right? They, it was hard to know because social media doesn't allow a right. lot of illumination frequently of conversation, but there were fleeting images. And it was hard to know from remove who these people were. But by the time they see that, you know, they're watching these young women in, in the flatbed truck with their, with their flowers in their hair and AKs over their shoulders about to go off and fight ISIS. But it was the spirit of camaraderie that stayed with them. And I think for the US folks who had fought, who had come of age in the post 9-11 war on the military side, it was difficult because the US policy said you could not go to the front, right? In the, the way you could, you no know, boots on the ground was, as you remember well, the conversation. So they were advise and assist, but could not go to the front. And he's watching the young women and he has all this mixture of emotion. And when he was telling me about it, it was so very real, right? That like, you know, all he's, he said, you know, I thought of the 1962 MacArthur speech at West Point. Honor, Duty, honor country. Right. Yeah. Right. Let's talk about the ideology that these women follow, because as much of a fighting force as they were, this was really about a kind of grassroots women's lib, not only women's lib, but the whole idea of their movement um, following um, Turkish leader Abdullah Akhan, that Kurds can't really be free until women are free. And that on one hand, this kind of, this women's, it was a women's live movement that took in the, in the region and women wanted to come from all over the region to help fight. But at the same time, this caused um, a lot of problems for them with Turkey. So, the, you know, this is a group of Syrian Kurds who follow Abdullah Ocalan and the women's protection units are an offshoot of the people's protection units. And the people's protection units had affiliation, had, were an offshoot. And the book really goes into this complicated relationship, depending on where you sit, their relationship with the PKK uh, and the Kurdistan Workers Party. 
There was no question that these were Syrians who were Kurds who were fighting for home rule, right? They the right to name your children what you want, the right to publish in your own language, the right to have a passport, the right to be citizens of your of your re, of your country, of citizens of your land, uh, the right to celebrate your holidays, to publish in your language, to teach in your language. That was the movement at the beginning, right? These folks took up arms really to institute for the first time in the chaos of the Syrian civil war, um, Kurdish self-rule that was not aimed at a nation state, but was Abdullah Ocalan who read Murray Bookchin, who had was and these two ideas fused of grassroots participatory New England style town hall, um, democracy without hierarchy, with eco-consciousness, right? Deep environmentalism at the center, truly to the left of Bernie Sanders, right? Like uh, Murray Bookchin's former wife fought Bernie Sanders on a waterfront development project. And so once you started to put this story together, it's like, what were the odds that that ideology, which met Ocalan's notion that Kurds could not be free until women were free, would find its way to be implemented in a sliver of, land, of Northern Syria, where these ideas of women-centered type self-governance could be put into place. And the Americans would be the ones backing it you know you if i had put that on a whiteboard you'd be like i was with you until the guy in vermont right like you know that's too far Gail. but it's all it's all true and and it, it is what happened and what is continued to be happening the humanity of these women okay i don't know if we were to you know obviously their story and how these women are commanders and you know the the story whether they're men or women or trans i mean just the whole story of these commanders is so compelling and how they went after isis but the humanity of these women and how they're able to retain it in the face of everything that they're going through, the friendship, the love, the understanding, the way they treated their soldiers, including the men under their command, this motherly love, I feel like almost made them more successful than men in some ways. And um, I think that's what really kind of stuck with me, their hope, their optimism, even after, um, you know, their towns are about to fall. They're not really looking at the devastation that was caused. They're looking forward. And, and at the hope. defeat of the ideology that said women had no value and the defeat of ideology of extremism, right? And so it was that that motivated them because as they said to, you know, Nauru's the head of the Women's Protection Unit said to me, if we could lead in battle, we could govern come peace and no one could say we shouldn't be there. Because at the end of the day, to your point, it was about uh, what political rights they would gain for women afterward, right? If you look at the founding documents of their region, women are mentioned 13 times. Every town they took from ISIS has a male head and a female head of the civil councils. There are women's councils in every town. There are women judges uh, there who are trying cases. There are, uh, uh, you know, areas for women who are facing domestic violence to be able to go and have it mediated. All of these things are part of their political experiment um, that goes very far in talking about women's rights. But at the end of the day, they were sisters and daughters, right? And that's why I think so many people have written me about Azima, who in the middle of the fight for Kobani, when things look very bad, you know, her sister calls and she blows up at her sister and she's like, listen, I told you I was going to call you once we were done fighting ISIS. We're trying to beat them here. You know, I'll call you as soon as the fight is over. Don't worry, you know, and it kind of gives her a hard time. Like, do you need me to come sit on your sofa and hold your hand and make you feel better? Like, we're doing something here. And it was, I interviewed her and her sister together after a couple of months after Azima told me that story. And her sister was so funny about it because she said, yes, she, oh, she yelled at me so much. And then she paused and she said, but I didn't mind because at least I knew she was alive. And I think that moment, if you think about the two of them, that the technology that was involved of being on a phone in the middle of a battle with your sister who is fighting the Islamic state with the world watching, shows you everything in that just that one that one instant yeah yeah you know you dedicate this book to your in, in part to your father who was iraqi and you write in the book how this this story resonated with you when you first heard about these amazing women um because of how you were raised and you specifically mentioned this conversation in the book with with your father about how women are treated in society and how that shaped you 
Yeah, so my father was an amazing character um, and, you know, had lost his country as a boy, as the book talks about. This is really the most personal book uh, I'd written. And it definitely shaped everything for him that came afterward. And I'm a kid from PG County, right? Like I was very much shaped by that experience. And I remember at maybe eight or nine, we were playing soccer outside. Uh, and my, I, my, I was saying, complaining to him about how all these women I saw uh, that had, were cooking and cleaning. I said, well, why can't they, the men cook and clean? Why should they women do it all day? Mm -hmm. He said, you've got to be kidding me. And looked at me and goes, do you really think men and women are equal? Hmm. And at least like, he didn't ask me with disrespect or, or trying to be rude. Like for him, it was as if I said, we're living on Mars and we'll eat lunch in a headstand upside down every day at noon, right? Like it was just absolutely unfathomable. And, and in the end, you know, years later, we were in South Florida, two, two decades later, and he had a Harvard Business School dad shirt on. And this lady in South Florida came up and was like, oh my God, how's your son? That sounds so great. And he was like, why can't it be my daughter? It's my daughter. And I said, oh, you know, it took me three decades, but you really got there. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I had a fraction of a shard of an inkling about what it would mean for young women in the region to not just be um, standing up for themselves, but to take up arms and to flip on its head everything everybody in their family thought they would be doing, their moms, their dads, their sisters, their uncles, and, and really bring that to life. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, we're going to open up for questions in a few minutes. And reminder, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A function, okay? And we'll try to get um, to as many as we can. Um, so the book ends on this triumph, it, it's about to end on this triumphant note after the fall, after the liberation of Kobani and, and then Turkey launches Operation Peace Spring to go after the, the Kurds and the US doesn't come to the defense. The US wouldn't even stand by them um, when they liberated because of these political issues with Turkey. And when the US doesn't come to them and these Turkish offensive, my heart, literally sinks when I'm reading this. I wanted people to just see the, the human stakes as we watch Rojda who goes from liberating Ainisa, freeing Yazidi women, who there's a scene about her with this woman who survived being, you know, like unspeakable things by ISIS, but ends up being, you know, very much uh, eloquent and helpful to, with intelligence, right, about this. So, um, all the way from that to liberating Ionisa from ISIS, leading uh, the campaign to retake Raqqa from ISIS with the US, alongside the US, talking to the Americans multiple times per day, to going back to the same town that she liberated from uh, ISIS to defend against uh, the Turkish backed incursion. But this time she was alone. And to me, there is, you know, this book is not about politics. It really is about the human uh, dimensions of policy. And this tension that the Americans walked the entire time with NATO ally Turkey, which is deeply important to the US and also had a view once the Americans started working with this group, because even up till 2015- They really we, represent the US values in so many ways. Yeah, and, and diplomatic talks had been going on. And in fact, candidate Biden, I have a piece coming up next week, the candidate Biden had really talked about leading US diplomacy to get to a better place between Turkey and this group of Syrian Kurds and, and Muslim, the head of the SDF, and others have been very vocal about wanting to have that diplomatic outreach. So we will see, we have some very important decision points coming up. Well, that brings me to my last question before we open up. And I think um, our friend Steve Cook is on, um, is watching today. He had a, a very, um, I would say, um, sobering and almost depressing kind of look at, you know, what's at stake, lessons learned um, in terms of what comes next in US policy. And, and he essentially comes to the sad conclusion that like after all these years of US involvement in Syria, we still don't know what we're doing. We don't have a good enough answer to do anything new. And, you know, should we be coming to terms with Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, you know, how the world, how should the world look at it? And unfortunately, he comes to the conclusion that there isn't enough at stake in terms of U.S. interests in Syria to do much more than sanction, go after ISIS terrorists and, 
and protect Assad's many tr transgressions. Like there's very little about, you know, Turkey's transgression against the Kurds. And I think there's this whole issue about, you know, go, it's a much longer issue about the US responsibility to protect and such, but that, you know, have, do we really know what's at stake or is this about kind of US values and a, and a, a human as you write perspective? So I think we could talk about this for 45 minutes. I mean, I could literally just, we could have a whole discussion just about that one question. The book really talks about the US hunt for a Syria policy starting in 2011, right? The time has come for Assad to step aside was the official policy, but the reality is that Bashar Assad has now gone through the Obama administration, the Trump administration, and it doesn't look like he's going anywhere anytime soon, except maybe a day trip to Tehran or to Moscow. So that is the on the ground reality. The Russians have reshaped the region. If you look at it, there was a US uh, Obama administration official who said, look, Russia brought the EU to its knees and all it had to do was drop bombs on Aleppo. So there is a real discussion about the refugee crisis that has been created by this, the uh, US, uh, the diminishment of, of US leadership in the region that is a result of this and the humanitarian cause. All, I'm gonna put all of that aside because I think that is a much bigger discussion about the fact that the ghost of the Iraq war hangs and hung over every decision made on Syria. On the question of uh, Northeastern Syria and in specific, this is not about nice to have, this is about America's national security, right? This is about keeping the pressure on the Islamic State, which Defense One just had a great piece about other parts of the world where it would love to uh, put its imprint even further, right? It's much easier to kill a terrorist than to slay an ideology. And the notion of the Islamic State is far from over. And I think that is why this is in the end about how America continues to work with the folks it continues to even today in this moment partner with in keeping the pressure on the Islamic State and how it how much it decides to value um, the importance of keeping up the pressure against ISIS, which President Biden talked about very recently, as did Secretary Blinken. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't know that the US is kind of ready to make these hard decisions, but it's the truth of the matter is that the Kurds are the only fighting force really that's ready, willing, and able to do it. And it's really just a question of whether the US is gonna, I feel like at some point, if the US is gonna go back to them, they're gonna have to offer, they're gonna have to offer something. Um, let's open it up to questions. We have one question um, from Daryl uh, Blocker, I think it is. So to, to paraphrase, um, you write about women, you tell the stories about women, what led you down this path? And how has telling these stories, which put women in the front, changed the conversation in terms of classic gender roles in the military? Yeah. I mean, that, that is another way of asking to you, like, how does this book fit in with your other work? So I never set out to write about women, which is actually kind of the funny part. I set out to tell stories that weren't being told about issues that deeply matter to America's security. And what you see is that one thing that many people can agree on is that women's stories aren't really serious. They don't really matter. And I deeply disagree with that notion. And I actually knew that there was an audience that deeply disagreed with that notion also. And that to me was the most important thing that you could tell a war story that looked different, but was about exactly the same issues. Right, uh, security, stability, prosperity, the fight against extremism, the fight for a brighter future. The work is animated by this notion that actually comes to me as a result of PG County, which is that suffocated opportunity is the enemy of global stability. It is all about talent, tapping into potential, making sure that everybody can exercise their God-given uh, abilities because we need more people with more of a stake with more of a voice in more of the world, fighting for more prosperity and more security for us all. We need a more agenda instead of just because things have always been, this is the way they should always be. And I wanted, I think at this moment to kind of question the whole notion of we have to live by rules we didn't write that govern our lives. Um, another question from Debbie Manz Manzanares. I hope I said that right. How do we follow how these women are doing today and how could we support them? Great question, Debbie. It is a great question. Uh, in terms of how you follow, um, I think there are lots of folks who are doing great reporting from the region. And also they have their own social media. 
uh, outlets and you could follow them directly. Um, I think the other thing is that um, very few people to your previous question, Elise, think anybody cares. There's almost no member of Congress that's hearing from their constituents regularly that this matters, that we care that there is a continued presence. And it's very important to note that America's like the Oz-like presence. You never see the Americans on the ground. They are not providing local security. They're not providing, you know, there's nothing in terms of the day-to-day -day life where you see them. And that is a huge success. Think about how different that is than almost any other context in the post 9-11 war. So I think if people really do want to engage, you should let those uh, who represent you know that you're watching and that you care. Uh, I'm not an advocate, but I can definitely say that I know from having worked across all sides of, of the Washington uh, sphere that that is noticed and noted. Um, okay, we have a question from my friend Skip. Um, you know, um, do you think that this Kobani story will be well enough, will be known well enough to change or improve how Middle Eastern men view women in general, um, kind of like Westerners with knowledge of the Battle of Stalingrad would have, you know, never questioned women's ability to, you know, um, expect to be in common? It's a great question. I think these women themselves have changed how their families see them. And I truly believe that the only way the world changes is homegrown agents of change, changing one family, one community, one neighborhood, one town at a time. And all those, I've never met stronger women than across communities, the Arab community, the Christian community, the, the community in the Middle East. And these women, you know, it's interesting. There's a big statue in Kobani to, uh, women uh, warriors, right? And to uh, Irene Marcon, and who has a quite a famous story that's in the book, who basically blew herself up to kill more ISIS as, it, as she was certain to face uh, ISIS wrath. And there's this huge statue of this female warrior. And then right next to it, there was an older man drinking tea in Kobani. And I went up to him and I said, um, you know, can you tell me what you think about this whole women's thing and the, the statue that's in your town now that was never there before? And he's, broke out a picture of his daughter who fought ISIS. And he said, she was injured three times. This is my daughter. And he said, I never thought, yeah. And he said, I never thought this would be her story, but we're really proud of her. And that's what you see all over the world, right? And look at my own story it was very similar. Right? And, and that, that. Yeah, that's yeah okay. This question is from um, Elena. Um, should, can the U.S. provide stronger leadership vis-a-vis vis -vis repatriation of women um, out of uh, the region? Understanding, of the course, this book is about a women's militia fighting against ISIS. But given U.S. counterterrorism and CVE interests, should this be a priority? How can experiences and information garnered from this conflict inform how we can and should employ a better gender sensitive lens when approaching these conflicts. And I mean, I, obviously what, how ISIS treated women, specifically the Yazidi women, I mean, that's a great point. So we did an event with US Institute for Peace uh, yesterday um, and they do tremendous work. I strongly urge you to follow what they're doing because they're always looking at lessons learned. Um, there's also a young woman who did uh, a survey across Assyrian communities about women's uh, roles and she was actually talking about post 2011 uh, Syrian Arab women really having their own kind of feminist awakening and, and really leading in their own communities so they do great work. Um, there are a lot of lessons learned and there's also a real issue let's go for a second to the extremism piece of the women who were members of the Islamic State, many of whom are citizens of countries that will not take them back. Uh, I was there twice and God willing will be able to go again. And interviewing them was one woman from Russia. I said, would you like to go home? And she said, no, they'll put me in jail. It's better to stay here. And international- well, talk, about, talk about the camp. Yeah, so this is whole camp, which okay. has now 13,000 international folks who are mostly children, who were, whose parents belong to the Islamic State and whose mothers were married to fighters from ISIS. 
and who are sitting in this purgatory because their nations will not take them back. And no one knows what to do with them. And I have been arguing that an international problem requires an international solution. It is not up Just to the, like with the guys from Guantanamo, like we're looking to repatriate them. We can't bring some of these people back from El Hall. I mean, no, but here's the thing, Elise, no one wants them. And so where does justice come in? First of all, secondly, how do you help the children? These children did not choose their parents' path. And, they, and as many people who fought ISIS have been pushing for the international NGOs to do more and for mostly the international community to fund international NGOs to do more and to support local NGOs on the ground um, to provide basics, medical care, sanitation, right? Yes, these people were part of the Islamic State, but they're humans. And so how do you figure out the next step of leading to a safer, more secure future while not just ignoring the problem, which is what the world has chosen to do? And it's been left to the very people who fought ISIS to deal with the aftermath almost alone. Well, the aftermath in so many ways, like the threat from Turkey, the camp. Um, are you in touch with the, I mean, and I know you're in touch with these women, like how, wh Talk to me about the situation on the ground there right now. So I think it's challenging, but there's a great deal of hope. And those two things live together, right? They're still trying to make sure that they can protect the gains they've made in terms of local self-rule. And, and they're, all of this governance piece is still in place even after the, the events of October 2019, which really astounded me when I saw it on the ground, right? It's a testament to local ownership and the enduring nature of what they built. It's not that it's perfect, but it is a better shot than many things uh, that we've seen. And there are people, and not Baladi just did a survey where they're talking about there are people who said they would rather be there than in regime held territories because you could exercise some basic freedoms. And I interviewed a teenage boy who said his mom wanted to go home, but he didn't because this was home for him. Mm. Now, not regime territory. Uh, so all, but they have a, a keen awareness that their future will depend in some part on U.S. policy. So it's a critical moment. The what comes next, the and then what has hung over this story from the start and never has it been more pivotal than this moment. Stand by. Can you hear me still? Yes, I can. Oh, okay. I have this other microphone, you know, this, the, trials and tribulations, Ooh, yes. working from home. Okay, so from Elizabeth Spencer, to your point about policy, beyond speaking to our representatives, is there anything that stands out to you that everyday Americans can do to keep accountability for supporting our Kurdish allies as a priority of US foreign policy? I mean, look, I think that the Biden, in my view, maybe the Biden administration is more willing to kind of, um, you know, put our money where our mouth is in terms of supporting them from an American values point of view. But as Stephen Cook, our friend points out, you know, and I think there is a recognition in the Biden administration that the interests just are, yeah. you know, there are other fish to fry right now. For That's right. And this is where I say, let's go back to the book in 2014. The only reason why America got involved in Kobani or I would say the only. The it's greatest great. reason was because of CNN, Elise. And, and, and Obama administration- well, that was when I worked there. I mean, yeah, that exactly. was foreign policy. So it was the fact that, and, and Obama administration officials are in the book talking about that, right? It was the fact that you Americans, Europeans, people in the region were watching as this David versus Goliath standoff took shape. David also was a woman in this case, and you had this fighting force that no one had heard of outside the region in a place very few outside the region had ever heard of that was giving a real fight to the Islamic State for the first time. And that was captured from cameras in Turkey and sent onto the global stage. That made the difference. So I will tell all of you that if, you know, just go back to the history. If folks hear from you who are in Washington, if you're talking about writing about that will actually probably do more than anything in Washington would to make Washington representatives, you know, your feel that people actually care, that they're engaged. And on all my website, for those of you who want no more, is, is a list of, under the book, a list of local organizations uh, and some uh, regional organizations that are very active on the ground. So both of those, and if you still have questions, just email me, there's a form on my website, you can email me, but they have a, a number of ways uh, and organizations that are doing work on the ground.
This is from Rima. Um, question is, we fret so much in the US about standards and whether women can meet the same physical standards as men, obviously. Uh, the whole life of Ashley's that, war, yes. They can, right, Ashley's war. Um, is there any way to provide these ama amazing women as a more mainstream example in the US? Like, I mean, okay, so let's compare with Ashley's war, which you're writing about an American fighting force and the audience, will that the reads the book the readers will be able to see that but like how do we and even when you look at women in military whether it's like uniforms or gear or such like you know um how do we make the idea that women are you know a a, a serious um component of the military more of a mainstream um issue? I will say that things are changing. Having had the privilege of working on this issue since 20 or 2012, when I started working on Ashley's War. Ashley's War came out in 2015, while the ban on women in ground combat was still in place. 2021 is a very different landscape. Much remains to be done, but women are doing it. And I think leadership, there are women advocates who are very much engaged. And I do think that military leadership is quite uh, aware and really focused on the talent piece, which is the most important thing. But at the beginning of, of Daughters of Kobani, it all starts with one of the soldiers, uh, Kathy from Florida, uh, who, who is part of Ashley's war, who is there with special operations in Syria and calls me and says, you have to come see this. She said, and we're almost jealous because there are no rules, there's no restrictions. It's like, if you're capable, you lead. And there was definitely something there. And the other funny thing about that, and this is, you know, just to, we need all need a little bit of humor in our lives, is that Rojda and Azima, uh, the, who you meet, would always give the, the Americans a hard time and say, where are the rest of the women? You know, we heard there's so many strong women in the US, yeah. where are they? And they, oh no, we have women. Well, okay, so where are they? And, and they would ask them all the time. Well, I remember one time um, someone, it's escaping me who exactly came up and said uh, to them, I want to speak to your commander. Yes. And yes, that was the, a special operations leader who kind yeah, of- Yeah, the special you, operations you, leader, was it Rojda or Azima? And um, she said, I'm right here. <laughs> yeah. I am the commander. Yeah, and it really did flip for them that the whole narrative of who's the leader, right? And, and the special operations folks by then were very used to it, but they were kind of giving the conventional forces a sort of rite of passage, knew that the person from the conventional forces would go up and say, hey, you know, nice to meet you to this right. man. Right. And he was like, uh, if you're looking for my commander. <laughs> to the left. Um, okay, so we, we have just about a, a couple of minutes left. So I, I wanna kind of bring this um, full circle and just talk about the amazing reception. It's on the New York Times bestseller list. I mean, all wonderful. Um, but, but you know, look, we know because we're writers in the field and all of our you know, colleagues in the national security space that have written books and some of them are on this call know that it's really hard to get this kind of traction on a book about national security. And I think it's because of the human story, but you know, you hit a nerve here. And I wanted you to just talk a little bit more about the reception of this story, both on the military side and the American side. And, and what can we take from um, this amazing reception of this story when so many other stories of resilient women um, or stories of the Middle East or stories about ISIS um, do not resonate in this way? I mean, I, I personally think that the, this is a story about women, resiliency, um, you know, uh, you know, obviously the Middle East, but but I feel like it's the humanity and the resiliency of this women. But I'm I'm really be interested to hear what you say. Well, first I want to thank you. You wrote a beautiful piece at the beginning that really you know started it all, Elise. So I really I and you talked about it in human terms, which is why I think it, it helped launch it in human terms. But I grew up in a community of single moms, none of whom had college degrees, all of whom worked two jobs. My mother worked at the phone company when there was just one phone company <laughs> during the day and sold Tupperware at night. And the notion of communities of women underestimated from the outside who rise to the moment in service to a cause greater than themselves has always resonated with me. 
we talk about national security and foreign policy as if it's nameless, faceless people up against other nameless, faceless people. And what I learned from my upbringing is that there are plenty of Americans who are eager to get engaged in this dialogue, but we never talk to them as if we respect them, as if we're going to give them an entry point to tackle very complicated issues. Or in a way that makes them want to care. Really. That's right. That's right. And, 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 you know, my godmother worked overnights at the government printing office and she called me and said, oh, I, I loved it. I'm so surprised. And I always give her such a hard time. Like, you don't need to be so surprised that you like it every time. She's very honest. But it is that kind of let's talk to people as if they have a stake in it because they do and not talk, just talk to ourselves. And I do think being an outsider from the class perspective actually really helps me find stories that resonate. Well, look, we could go on and on and we probably will over, you know, uh, many conversations. <laughs> thank you so much. But I, I mean, just want to thank you, Gail. Thank you for writing this book. You guys, I read it in maybe 24 hours. It's a must read. And um, it's just a beautifully written uh, story of humanity, women's empowerment, that weaves in the US policy. I, I mean, I, I've already given it to like five friends as gifts. Like it's an amazing book and it's a must read. So I just wanna thank the Truman Center. I wanna thank Gail uh, um, and, and Rachel back to you to close. Gail, Elise, thank you so much to both of you. That was an incredible conversation. And for those of you who are attending this conversation, we will put a recording of this up on uh, the Truman Project's YouTube channel, and we will share it widely on social media. So if you have any friends who missed the conversation, they will be able to see it as well. Again, both of you, thank you so much. Uh, and I hope everyone has just a fabulous weekend. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Truman Project. Thank you. Bye-bye.